Uh, totally delighted to have this, this huge crowd, uh, both here in person uh, and also on Zoom. Got a lot of, lot of attendees for this, this big event. I'm Dan Slater. I'm the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. Um, and today is our, our final event of the year uh, at uh, WCED, but it is our first event of, uh, of, of the week for uh, these, we have three events uh, here at the University of Michigan uh, featuring our esteemed guest, uh, guest James, Jim Scott. So I always like when an end is also a beginning. So we're, we're, we're ending the year. It's been a great, a great year here, but also starting a nice, nice round of talks. And I have to give you know, the, really the credit and big thanks to my, to my friend on my right, Christian Davenport, uh, who many of you know here from the University of Michigan, uh, who really, this is his brainchild. It was his kind of vision that made this all happen. Um, I've been really privileged to be, to be a part of it and to be able to, 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 to help out. So we're happy to host this. Uh, Christian's going to preside over the, uh, over the session. Uh, so he'll probably offer some, some feedback after Professor Scott's comments and maybe an interjection or two as we go along. Uh, I will try to stay back. And uh, I'll just basically be here to curate the Q&A both uh, live and uh, online. I do also want to say before we start, I want to acknowledge the fact that we are currently in a strike situation here at the University of Michigan. Uh, and I guess with my WCED hat off, uh, just want to give full support to the, to, to the students and everything that they're pushing for. With my um, and with, with my WCED hat on, I guess I'd like to say I really hope the administration will find a way to, you know, move toward you know, you know, offer a, a living wage to our graduate students. We love graduate students; they're a huge part of what makes this a community. So, uh, I think my uh, my co-panelists and I are all uh, very much in, in agreement on this. So, did not want to let that uh, that pass by. But I don't want to take more time. Uh, we're going to have a, a really a wonderful lecture today. But for more on our our guests and the theme of today, I have to turn it over to uh, to Christian Davenport here on my right. Thank you, um, Christian Davenport, uh, political science, public policy. Um, professor Scott is a Sterling Professor of Political Science and Professor of Anthropology at Yale University. He's the founding director of Yale's Agrarian Studies Program, currently co-run by a mutual friend, Libby Wood, uh, Professor Elizabeth Wood, sorry. Um, <laughs> named Global Thinker by Foreign Policy, and this is noteworthy on his CV because there's a question mark and a huge exclamation point after it. So either, either that was part of the award or Jim was just like, I don't know why I got this, but. Um, <laughs> I definitely was, I was struck by that. Um, there's numerous awards, and I'll actually stop at that point because if someone informs you that they can send you the longer CV on their CV, then this is, um, there's too much to wade through. Um, but Jim is known for many things, um, and one of the most prominent concerns is interest in challenging political, economic, as well as social cultural elites. And so in many respects, given the current context, there's nobody better to come to the University of Michigan. Um, weapons of the week, seeing like a state, the other not being governed against the grain. These are, I don't know, um, constellations, lights. They are, they are projection points. They're starting off points for so many of us in many respects. Um, his focus, though, has not been on the most obvious forms typically studied in the social sciences as it relates to contentious politics and political conflict and violence, except maybe the earlier stuff on rebellion, but we'll, we'll let that slide for now. Um, most folks, as we know, study revolution, civil war, human rights, state repression, genocide, all of which are either rare or variable in frequency. Jim's gaze is cast to those activities that are actually the most common and that generally pass unnoticed by the casual observer and analyst. Um, indeed, one of the th many, many things that I've come to learn from Jim is that the repressed and oppressed are seething with contempt for those in positions of power and they are constantly working on efforts to counteract their condition. Getting to the point of actually studying that, however, is very difficult since many of us are distracted by the, 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 the bright, shiny thing that states tell us that we should focus in on. But from Jim, I've come to have a better appreciation for the impulse to freedom that exists within all human beings and to not despair about conformity, but rather to seek out the threat of resistance that exists in everything, everywhere. With that, please join me in thanking Professor Scott for coming and for giving us what I'm sure will be a fabulous lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. I'm honored to have such a monster crowd. Um, the, I do want to say, uh, express my support for the graduate students and the graduate student strike. Uh, 
the last time I was arrested was uh, supporting the graduate student uh, organizing at Yale. Um, and I got to sit next to Baird Rustin, um, who also came to support the graduate students. And he said to me, uh, the spring before, he'd received an honorary degree from Yale. And he said to me, I finally found a use for an honorary degree. <laughs> uh, and you know, uh, it was, it's worth coming just to say how much I support the graduate students, the proletariat of the teaching faculty, and uh, I hope they succeed. Um, the, I want to start in a curious way with um, oh, a whining, I suppose, or a kind of complaint about uh, the practice of the social sciences, uh, it's not working. Okay. Yeah, the light is on. We all hearing him? Yes. It's also the, the Zoom. Can you hear me now? OK. Uh, I, I want to start with some, um, some aspects of the practice of social science that I find have not served me well, uh, most of which I practiced myself uh, and have uh, only later realized um, are less than useful in many respects. One of them, and it explains why I'm uh, a political scientist, uh, trained as a political scientist, but with anthropology envy. Um, and when I decided I wanted to work on peasants, I realized I had to spend uh, time in a peasant village as a, a, in, as a fake anthropologist right? uh, and understand what uh, peasant life was like to the extent that I was capable of doing that. Um, and so it seemed to me that, that one of the problems of political science and sociology um, is that they tend to go into, into a situation with questionnaires um, in which they figured out the alternatives that are uh, available for you to respond to. And there are questions that people perhaps have never asked themselves, never thought was very important, and forget a moment uh, after they've given you an answer just to sort of get rid of you uh, and to be uh, compliant. Uh, and it seems to me that the the one large insight of anthropology that is extremely important for me is that if social science, which is most social sciences, want to understand why people behave in a certain way, and if you want to understand why people behave in a certain way, the only way to begin is to ask them for the best explanation they can give of why they think they're doing what they're doing. That is to say, and, and that is not a questionnaire, right? That is listening to them with you being uh, as little a stimulus as possible. Uh, and so in that sense, it seems to me that social science that doesn't, it's not that the people are not themselves deceived, uh, they're not made, perhaps they're even trying to deceive you, and so on, but it's the only way to start. Uh, and any other social science that doesn't ask people for the best explanation they can give for what they think they're doing is social science behind people's backs, all right? Uh, and that's why I think that the insights of anthropology um, uh, ought to be uh, more generally practiced than they are. The second thing that has struck me is the question of units of time in which we think. Um, in a perfectly natural way, I'm guilty of it as anyone, um, our default unit is a human lifetime. That's right, because we're homo sapiens after all. And um, at the most expansive, we think of our parents, uh, us, and our perhaps children, uh, three generations. Uh, so the unit of time is a human lifetime. And I think it's become increasingly clear to all of us that um, the unit of time ought to depend radically on the subject of study. Um, so that I'm, I happen to be working on the deep history of a river. 
and I've tried to think really hard about what river time uh, is like. Uh, or to me, the most expansive is um, uh, the um, geological time, uh, uh, which is also um, a, a much larger uh, scope. And anything that has to do with climate change or the Anthropocene has to encompass units of time uh, that are much, much larger than the units of time with which we're accustomed to deal. And so somehow the units of time ought to be uh, subject and question specific in a way in which they are never, and the default unit ought not to be a human lifetime or something shorter than a human lifetime. I suppose, if you like, if you like, mosquito time uh, would be uh, much shorter uh, unless you want to talk about mosquitoes as a collective uh, over time uh, evolutionarily. Um, so the longest, of course, are the tectonic plates, right? Uh, that is uh, a very long and crucial, uh, I gather, for uh, the distinctiveness of our planet. The other unit that is also mesmerizing um, and um, often gets in our way more than facilitating our understanding is our concept of space, uh, which for political scientists is more or less confined to the nation state. Um, a fairly recent invention, if you like, after the Westphalian Treaty in uh, 1648. Um, and um, when recently I went to a, uh, a conference on Chinese environmental history, and it was devoted to everything only within the borders of China. Well, you know, the climate and environment do not respect these uh, abstract lines that uh, uh, are the borders of the Chinese state as it was established in the late Ming. Uh, and so it seems to me that if uh, I discovered, of course, that in Southeast Asia, if you want to understand the hilly areas, they encompass much of northern and Southeast Asian states, uh, Gui, uh, Gu, um, uh, Guizhou and uh, Yunnan, and uh, into northwestern India. Uh, and that is a unit, uh, thanks to Willem van Schendel, who worked on this, uh, which he calls Zomia. And it's a unit that has much more integrity in terms of its social structure, linguistic structure, uh, its forms of subsistence than anything within the nation state. So it seems to me that increasingly, the kinds of things that we study are, um, if they're confined to the abstract lines on the map uh, that are national boundaries, uh, are not helping us. It's not. The, they help us in, in, in specific questions, but it has to be asked, is this, are national boundaries relevant to this particular form of inquiry? And the same thing should be said, um, I, what I'm going to talk about, the body of what I'm going to say, is about everyday forms of resistance. Um, and it seems to me that in the same way, we are fairly mesmerized by um, an obsession with uh, open public protest demonstrations, formal organizations, social movements, and so on, uh, characteristic of open societies uh, that for whom this is uh, a standard practice of mobilization, uh, protest, uh, and so on. And the point is simply that for most of human history and for most people in the world today, for that matter, uh, these forms of expression of opinion and, and political organization uh, are extremely dangerous uh, and rare. Uh, and Mark Bloch, in his um, uh, volumes on feudal society, says, yes, there are these little rebellions in the medieval period, but they're flashes in the pan. And if we want to understand uh, 
the if you grinding uh, disputes and conflict between the aristocracy, the monarchy, uh, and the peasantry, uh, we have to look at the day-to-day -day forms of struggle over land and crops uh, and subsistence. So in the sense, um, the point is that everyday forms of resistance strike me as being um, uh, worthy of much more study than um, uh, it has received. So uh, power is ubiquitous and even when it's balanced, um, we are very rarely totally open with one another. That is to say, the structure of politeness means um, uh, avoiding saying things that come to your mind that would disrupt uh, easy conversation uh, and so on. So I think it's, uh, it's Jane Austen uh, or George Eliot who said that no action is possible without a little acting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the kind of acting that I'm interested in, of course, is acting that is structured by a great differentiation of power uh, in which, um, and the greater the differentiation of power, the greater the guardedness of what the weaker party says, even silence, of course, right? Or stilted forms of dissent like saying yes sir but in a tone that is ambiguous and might actually be construed as a form of protest right but disguised in that way um, and the greater the um, the difference in power the greater the freedom of the stronger party to speak his or her mind right that is to say the silence if you like, from uh, subordinate groups, right, is matched by the, you know, it, it matters, it matters less what the master says to the serve slave or servant than what the servant says to the master because the consequences are so asymmetrical in that way. Um, the So I'm not only, What's interesting, at least to me, is not only the question of class conflict and material deprivation and who gets the grain, who gets the money, um, who gets the land, um, uh, who has to work for whom, but the question of the suppression of autonomy and voice and recognition and the muzzling that is, in a sense, if you like, the, the fate or the most um, uh, uh, the safest mode of behavior uh, in uh, situations of great power difference. Um, it's, and of course, if you take, for example, slavery, if you were a slave mother and you loved your children, you would teach them, teach them to be deferential to the master, to keep them safe um, uh, and not get them into danger and not get them punished or beaten. Uh, and so, in a sense, out of your love uh, for your uh, dear ones, uh, you end up doing part of the socialization, right, uh, that's required to have them obey the structure of power differentiation as it's expressed in daily life. Uh, it's also true that uh, you not only hear uh, uh, cautions, but you hear the anger as well. So uh, that's, not, uh, that's not trivial. So then the question is how arbitrary the power is. Um, and it seems to me that the more arbitrary the power, the more it approximates a form of terror. Uh, 
it, it satisfies the definition of terror. That is just, for me, I think, the definition of terror is uh, an arbitrariness in which you do not know what safe behavior is. That is, there is not, if you like, a zone with which in, within which you may act and be relatively safe and assured that you will uh, not come under fire, you will not be punished, uh, you will not be beaten, and so on. So terror is, true, true terror is the absence of uh, any sense of a zone in which expression is, uh, is permitted. I mean, it's quite interesting. Um, some of you probably saw in uh, some of the very early protests during the Ukraine war in St. Petersburg, somebody holding up a blank piece of paper with absolutely nothing written on it, right? Uh, who was then arrested for protest, right? Uh, and so that's, uh, if you like, um, uh, uh, an indication of a certain kind of terror. However, most situations of asymmetrical power uh, are also structured, uh, and there is a zone within which people can operate uh, more or less uh, safely. And that difference is extremely important in terms of the forms of expression and the way in which they are um, developed. Um, the, so, I've done a sort of chart in my mind, so I'm going to try to describe it. So if you think of forms of um, dissent, forms of um, resistance, there is, if you like, the visible part of the spectrum, which is that spectrum that we concentrate on, the bright, shiny objects that Christian is talking about, the protests, riots, strikes, uh, and so on. And then what I think is the larger and more massive uh, part of the spectrum, uh, which is uh, not immediately apparent. And so uh, to, to start from kind of elemental things, let's say, uh, someone takes a rabbit from the forest claimed by the aristocracy and the monarchy uh, in England. It's not a, not a trivial thing, but since poaching of wood, and uh, from 1650 to 1850, the most common form of rural conflict in England and the most thing, thing most prosecuted uh, was poaching. Right. Uh, so this was a struggle over land. There were no petitions, there were no marches, there were no demonstrations and so on. By and large, there was occasionally a fire, uh, but by and large, this struggle took place on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's imagine someone um, uh, uh, captures a rabbit on land that they're not entitled to um, access. Is this resistance or not? Well. It's not easy to tell. Uh, everybody liked, at least then, liked rabbit stew. Um, uh, and this is just, right? And, and, and so the question is, how do we define this act ever as an act of resistance unless we have other evidence about it, right? Um, and of course, we're not interested in individual acts by and large, and nor are we interested uh, in, a, in a deep sense, in the intentions within a single brain. Uh, and, the, and the reason why, at least, you have, because it's not openly declared, the way in which I understand this poaching for two centuries to be a form of resistance is that there was a tacit complicity of other villages. It was almost impossible for game wardens ever to get people in villages to testify against their fellow villagers in a poaching violation of one kind or another, right? Mm -hmm. And so the fact is that the, if you like, the wall of silence that the law met and that the game wardens met, right, um, is at least a fairly 
interesting indication that there was this approval. We can deepen that by understanding folk culture in which people say that a land that it's not, that people have not worked on is gift of God and doesn't, can't belong to anyone, mm -hmm. as opposed to land in which crops have been planted and that have been so-called improved in that sense, right? So there is a, a folk culture of nature as being available to everyone as common property and common land that circulates in the folk culture as well. That is, if you like, the compost out of which a, this complicity and so on grow. So the interesting thing about forms like that of resistance is that one has to tease out um, in a way that's not openly expressed uh, the forms of tacit coordination, complicity, uh, and so on that, uh, that might style it as an act of resistance. So um, the question of intention, the, the whole point is everyday forms of resistance exist by not declaring their intention, right? Um, that's the point. The, and the, intention is, I think, for a social scientist, not what is in the brain of the actor, but the intention is socially configured. That is to say, it's if an act, whether or not intended as a form of resistance, is treated by the state, by the monarchy, by the aristocracy, by the police as an act of resistance, it becomes an act of resistance. Uh, that is to say, the, its continuation is a form of dissent and right, uh, resistance uh, against the structure of power. So in that sense, intention is, socially, is a social construction, uh, to use the sort of common term uh, mm -hmm. that's used. Uh, mm -hmm. And my, an example that I think is a kind of brilliant example of Robin Kelly's is of the zoot suit, right, during the Second World War. Uh, and the zoot suit was just simply sort of lavish uh, clothes uh, uh, and hanging out on corners. Um, uh, and, and because it was uh, a costume, if you like, of blacks, um, it was seen by people in military uniform and by the police and by the authorities as an act of dissent against uh, the war, an act of protest against the war. Whether it was intended initially as an act of protest against the war, I don't know, and neither does Robin Kelly. But once it was defined that way, wearing a zoot suit became an act of open defiance because it was socially constructed in that way. Mm -hmm. So that in a sense, um, what <coughs> counts as resistance is not solely the intention of the people who are doing it, uh, but the way in which it is treated, understood, uh, and reacted to by the authorities. Um, so <coughs> I think we're interested generally in the more massive and consequential forms of everyday resistance. And, and here, I tried uh, in Domination in the Arts of Resistance to make the contrast between essentially activities with the same objective, one of which was everyday forms of resistance, and the other of which was open resistance to the bright, shiny objects uh, Christian referred to. So for example, desertion is everyday resistance. Um, a third of Confederate troops in the Civil War deserted. Um, you could say, like poaching, nobody wants to get killed. Um, 
but if you examine the folk sayings behind it, the saying was, the Civil War is a rich, it's a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. And when it became very deadly, a lot of this, particularly Appalachian people who didn't have in the higher altitudes, who didn't have slaves at all, uh, were unwilling to die to protect the property and slaves of people in the lowlands, right? Um, and so, but desertion was just simple people leaving the military and going home, in this case, in whole units sometimes, and never being reconscripted. That is the everyday form of resistance. Mutiny is the bright, shiny object. Mm. That is, mutiny is seizing your officers, uh, declaring right an end to military um, uh, leadership and hierarchy. Uh, and it, it may have the same objective, uh, mm -hmm. but it is that sort of open declaration and therefore much more dangerous to the states, right, uh, as well. Um, uh, poaching, well, if you think of, let's say, the difference between a, an open invasion of land, which is the bright, shiny object, as opposed to poaching, right, which is the hidden effort to appropriate land but undeclared, right? Uh, and uh, in a sense, the open form is a more direct challenge to the state and always more dangerous uh, and, uh, and threatening. If you think of um, I'm missing one of the, um, uh, oh, it, if you, the difference between squatting and a land invasion, that is to say, uh, let me, I, I want to illustrate the importance of open declarations as opposed to uh, dis dissent that is disguised. Um, so, for example, in Latin America and the Catholic Church, in Central America as well, most people were not married in church. They were, uh, marriages were common law marriages, what we would call, right, without the sacrament of, uh, of, uh, of, of marriage being celebrated in a church. So if you compare, let's say, the avoidance of church sacrament for marriage, as opposed to standing up in the middle of a mass and declaring that the sacrament of marriage uh, is a travesty and uh, something that should be abolished, that is a direct challenge to the church and would be met with a whole a lot more opposition, if you like, than this tacit dissent which can be tolerated. Um, and so there, there's the ways, it, it, I'm studying the Burmese um, resistance to the military junta, and the, and the forms of creativity that people uh, manage to find in order to express dissent and keep themselves relatively safe are quite extraordinary. And one of the earlier examples that um, I was interested in was the solidarity movement in Poland. Um, and there was uh, my favorite example from solidarity, though there are many, many examples from that movement is that somebody in the city of which I think decided, or a number of people decided, that the, the state news broadcast was at 6 o'clock p.m. and it was all lies, right, about the military regime under Jaruzelski. And someone said, I don't want to listen to this. Let's all go take a walk during the... Um, take a walk outside during the government news broadcast. And it quickly spread all over Poland so that at exactly 6 o'clock, millions of people appeared at their door and took a walk for exactly a half hour and then came back home, right? And nothing is illegal about taking a walk between 6 and 6.30, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they also 
came to wear the hats on backwards just to sort of add another touch of, of dissent to this. And the regime was beside itself uh, about how to deal with this. And their response was to declare a curfew from 6 to 6.30 <laughs> so that everyone had to be inside when the government news broadcast took place. And within a week, the polls took their television to the window and had it play out to the street where the only people there were the security forces, right? And made it clear that they were not listening to the government curfew. So here's a sort of form of endless invention that is partly because it has the strength of huge numbers and quasi-anonymity and so on, uh, has a kind of power, and yet you can imagine the kind of how people felt buoyed by the success of this as a form of resistance. Uh, and so it, it was, in a sense, playing on exactly that boundary of what can be gotten away with, right, that is difficult to repress. And it's not as if populations don't discover this permeable zone in which they're always testing um, the limits. Um, the, my, my favorite examples of this in, uh, in novels, and I'm fond of saying that if 50% of what you're reading is social science, you're making a mistake. Um, you, you, because there's poetry, there, there, there's novels. And so one of the best examples of everyday forms of resistance is Balzac's Les Paysans, in which a bourgeois family has bought a huge plot of land. But it's post-revolution, and uh, in the vacuum created by the revolution, the peasants have taken over the forest. And uh, the people who bought the land may have the piece of paper, but uh, they don't control the forest uh, and never get to control the forest. And the other example, which is totally brilliant, and I don't know anything even remotely like it, is Gustav Husak's Good Soldier Schreit. Um, uh, and this is a bumbling soldier. And you never can figure out whether he's cunning and brilliant or whether he's just stupid and bumbling. Um, and it's, it, it's that line in which he always saves, stays safe and only other people get into trouble. And, it, and Gustav Husak somehow understood um, the difference between mutiny, if you like, and internal desertion and, uh, and playfulness uh, and uh, evasion of responsibilities. The, I don't want to go on too much longer. Um, the, there, there are more formal ways of disguise that become institutionalized historically. And those are often in forms of what I would call deferential protests. So Daniel Field, in a book called Rebels in the Name of the Czar, has a long account of petitions submitted by peasants. Mm. Um, and these petitions, of course, are written by notaries, right? People who are specialized in exactly how to structure a petition to the crown uh, and uh, to the czar. Uh, and they always begin with, we, your most obedient, abject servants, do humbly beseech the great czar, the benefactor of his population, blah, 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 right? And in the middle of it, it essentially says, reduce the taxes or we're going to make a mess. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the, it ends, we do thank the great czar for all of his. And so, so, I mean, you imagine that the people in the court who are reading these petitions skip all of the <laughs> babble in the beginning and at the end and are interested in what is the operative phrase in the middle. But it's a form of protest clothed you know, to excess in forms of deference uh, and loyalty so that it's not, uh, if you like, positioned as a protest against the monarchy. Mm. It is telling the monarchy uh, 
we expect great things from you. We are your humble servants, uh, and so on. Another version of this is um, um, the is possession. And uh, the anthropologist I. M. Lewis, uh, in his book called Ecstatic Religions, has a long section on the way in which protest, he is worked in the Horn of Africa, but he was interested in Roman religion and so on, is the way in which possession was a way mm -hmm. of voicing protest and not having to take responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. That is to say, it wasn't you who was doing the speaking and when you were possessed, it was the spirit who had possessed you and it could be exorcised uh, in due course. And his mm -hmm. argument is that for lower class men and for women in particular, possession was a way of expressing dissent uh, in a way that you didn't have to take personal responsibility for um, uh, slandering someone, for, uh, for complaining against the patriarchy in the case uh, of, of women. Um, <clears throat> so that's a kind of, if you like, ventriloquism, right? Uh, in which you uh, find, if you like, a spokesperson by uh, the form of possession. It's not the only function that possession has, of course, uh, but it seems to me to be extremely important uh, politically. And his argument is also that it's the minor gods who are dissenting gods in some way that are extremely important uh, in the religion of um, the uh, lower echelons of Roman society. <clears throat> What's interesting in, uh, in, let's say, Burma is there is the Buddha, of course, and then there are all the so-called Nats. And the Nats um, are these pre-Buddhist spirits that still are very important to the Burmese. They worship at Nat shrines. And what's interesting about many of the Nats is that they, um, they all were presumed to have been real people who died or were killed, and they all were involved in acts of um, uh, dissent against, this, against the crown, uh, so that the two, one of two of the most famous Nats, and it's the, it's the site for a kind of carnival in Burma, um, carnivalesque where things are permitted that are otherwise in the year are not permitted. The, the, it's the two brothers who were Nats now, spirits, mm. and they were supposed to, everyone was supposed to bring a brick for a new pagoda for the great Buddha. And they were busy playing marbles, so they didn't bring a brick. Um, and they were then killed for uh, disloyalty and so on. And so, but they're celebrated, and they're celebrated in a sense partly because, right, they didn't do what the crown expected uh, of them. Um, the, Lila Abu Lugad, who works on um, Bedouin society, uh, tried to understand the use of poetry in Bedouin society as a little like possession, as a means for men and women uh, who did not believe in uh, the patriarchy to express their dissent uh, from that. Um, how, mu how long am I doing? Two minutes. Two minutes? Okay. Um, so, I do, want, I do want to make as much time for, um, but let me just refer to something. Um, what's interesting, I, I, I tend to think now, and I didn't, it's not in my, in my work, this was 30 years ago after all, um, it was not in my work, I, I tend to think of, of this, if you like, whole spectrum of everyday forms of resistance as being the soil, or if you will, the compost from which forms of open resistance may occasionally burst, right? That is to say, 
it is the unexpressed, right, uh, that finally at moments of crisis, uh, uh, and, and when they do, they are often far more explosive uh, and, and astonishing in a way. And so I'm thinking of the end of Ceausescu in which it was at a public uh, meeting and the chance, this was in 89, so it was the end of the, of the Soviet bloc, and some students began some chant against Ceausescu at the back, and it finally took over the whole um, uh, a crowd, and everyone was uh, screaming for Ceausescu to, to leave or be murdered. Um, and since it was on television, everybody in Romania saw it, and it was, you know, it was like, in a half hour, Ceausescu was finished, right, in terms of the public dissent. And obviously, it was there before, right? Uh, it's a question of, 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 its, uh, of its expression. And so, what's interesting to me is that those people who capture that are, become often, because People recognize, yes, that's what I think, but I haven't been able to say it. They become, or may become, charismatic figures. And I, I uh, to connect this to our understanding of charisma, you know, a lot of people talk about charisma as if it's a quality that a person has, but it's transactional. Uh, charisma is a relationship, right? Um, between a speaker and uh, the people to whom they are, uh, they are speaking. Um, and so it's a kind of resonance. And there's a passage in Taylor Branch's uh, The Parting of the Waters, mm -hmm. which is an extraordinary section of Taylor Branch's work. And he goes through a Martin Luther King sermon in granular, granular, granular detail in which you see that Martin Luther King tries out a, a stanza, if you like, and maybe people don't respond, or maybe the response is muted. He goes on to another one, and let's say people start stamping their feet because they like it and he elaborates it more and says it again in slightly different words, like two or three times, right? And, and if it gets a big response, he repeats it four or five times in different sort of mm -hmm. phraseologies. And so what's happening is that he is enormously tuned in to the response of the audience and he amplifies the things that has resonance with them. It's call and response, of course. Uh, it is, he's amplifying the things that have resonance with mm -hmm. them. And so you could say in a way that they, of all the things he had to say, they selected the sort of Martin Luther King sermon, mm -hmm. right? Uh, by responding to certain mm -hmm. things which were then amplified and became more important in sermons and so on. And so it, it's an understanding of how charisma works. And I, I might add that Trump and the MAGA base have some of the same relationship uh, as well. Uh, so it's not as if it's a, a, a left-wing monopoly. Um, but the, the, if, you, if you think of uh, one other example, and I'll close there. Roosevelt in the, in the first campaign, it was a very, it was a very conservative uh, lawmaker, actually. Um, and uh, because he was crippled, he conducted his campaign from the back of a train and went, I think there were like 300 stops that he made uh, across the country uh, at the back of the train. And he had speechwriters. And someone who was paying close attention to this noticed that they would stop at uh, a major crossing. There'd be a crowd. He'd give a speech. And everyone would, you know, there would be this response to some things. And the speechwriters would then sort of uh, elaborate on that particular theme and so on. And at the end of 300 stops, he had a radical speech. Uh, and you could say that, that there is a sense by selection 
the crowd had written that speech for him, mm -hmm. and that's how we ought to understand charisma. It's not that charisma doesn't have a creative part from the person who uh, is actually doing the expression, uh, and he captures things in new and magical ways, um, but to understand charisma is to understand that resonance and the way in which a kind of selection of themes uh, is over time uh, is likely to move people toward those things that have resonance and uh, away from those things that don't have resonance. And so uh, the, the argument is that Roosevelt realized that um, large steps were called for uh, because there was such a hunger for this in the population. So let me stop there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Okay. Well, characteristically marvelous set of remarks. Um, Christian, do you want to take a few minutes to offer any responses? Um, sure. for, first to clarify, he told me when to say he should stop. <laughs> There's no I'm rolling to stop Jim Scott. So he said, he said at 40, just kind of let, let me know so I don't go on too much, but you, you just kind of get caught up in it. Um, so as usual, there's, there's, there's so much to kind of like um, delve into, Jim, but um, I, I guess um, this bottom-up charisma thing is really fascinating in many respects, right? Um, uh, so as you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about Paul Kagame in Rwanda, and I think um, Kagame is one of the more charismatic African dictators on the planet. Um, but I've always looked to his, um, you know, personal attributes, characteristics that he had. The bottom-up component, I'm just literally, as you're sitting here saying it, just thinking about, because a large part of his, a large part of his resonance and kind of going along with the Roosevelt and the King examples, mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of things Kagame does all the time, which is kind of like, you can't help us. We can help us. Very, very black nationalist. And so it fits within the current context, like right now, right, because like, who better to speak for black folk than black folk? So shut up. <laughs> so Kagame's got like this amazing out, which is kind of like, well, you can't tell us anything. It's like, well, you have human rights violations. It's like, well, you can't tell us anything. You say, like, are you from here? When the genocide was going on, what were you doing? So every, he gets everybody to kind of go on the defensive. But where did he get that from? That from, from decades and all, I mean, I'm reading a book about, um, you know, the, the, the fortunes and how long Africa has been plundered and so forth. So he's taking advantage of this particular kind of like, guilt and using it in a way, but I hadn't thought of it as bottom-up charisma until you were saying it and then just thinking about how he's able to kind of constantly defray any criticism. And it's unfortunate, but in, on this spot, a, almost a week ago, a couple of days ago, the Global Equity Project or whatever it's called had the Minister of Health from Rwanda spewing the same propaganda that you'd expect to come out of the administration, and I hadn't quite caught the fact that this narrative is of this particular sort. And thinking through, I'm like, well, how do you counter this? I'm like, you can't criticize the person for anything because of he's tapping so many things about, oh, well, only the oppressed can speak for the oppressed. Only the African can speak for the African. I'm just like, well, what if they're doing some horrific stuff? He's like, nope, nope. <laughs> you can't say anything. And I'm just like, it's just interesting ways to shut people down. But then the University of Michigan became complicit with it. So I was kind of go like, okay, we need to figure this out. And this bottom-up characterization is now getting me to think about it. So this is more, this is more statement than anything else. But charisma is transactional, I, I found to be very fascinating. What I, what I think is repeatedly amazing about your work, Jim, is you help us realize that political order is a, is a social political construct. And just because we don't see civil war or protests or insurgencies or petitions or strikes going on, it doesn't mean everything is okay. Um, and actually, you, you kind of compel us to look for resistance to see exactly what the current situation really is. It's like the best, it's like a better barometer of, of political order and political satisfaction than anything else, but it's an incredibly harder task. And I think political science and public policy is incredibly complicit with the idea of we privilege political order as being the absence of these flashpoints and incredibly horrible things and think, okay, this place has order, it has some semblance of, you know, things expect things taking place when you expect them to. And your resistance concept is very much kind of antithetical to that. And I don't I know you don't have any necessarily any any love for political science or public policy for that matter, but there is a question of how 
Uh, first off, are you calling for a kind of like, um, or are you prompting us to replace the centrality of political order with the centrality of resistance? So you're calling us to kind of like to seek out the resistance and not kind of like presume that the order as indexed by these flashpoints, these bright shiny objects, because I think that's where mostly we've been. Are you suggesting that we should not be duped by that effectively? And this, it, you always made me think of Dunbar, right? It's like, um, you know, we wear the mask that grins and lies as it speaks to kind of African-Americans. Many people like have no idea about like African-American thought. They're just like, oh, okay, you know, they, they seemed happy, all this other complacency. I was just at the, the museum in DC and you're just kind of going, wow, African-Americans created a whole bunch of culture. And if you start looking at a lot of the things that they were talking about, it's seething with resistance. And so it was like perfect to kind of come, come here to kind of think about um, the blues or soul or rap and all these other kind of like right. signifying things that you'd look for, these places of resistance. But as you also note, um, many of us are not looking in those locations, so we might mischaracterize how satisfied or how pleased or how pleasant or how well off someone is by missing that kind of that code, that beat that's kind of going on, but only if you're looking for it. And so would you say that you're kind of calling for? Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not. <clears throat> I want to make short answers so that I don't yeah. cut off the possibility for um, comments from the audience. Um, but um, I, do, I do think it varies situation to a situation, but it's, it seems to me that, that in a sense, the question of material deprivation, which the Marxist side of me, right, uh, believes in and looks at carefully, um, tends to sort of miss the expression mm -hmm. of dissent, of uh, personhood, of uh, speaking your mind, if you like, uh, and that that is, um, uh, that is somehow um, in almost all situations is likely to be more important than we give it credit for. Mm -hmm. And those explosions are also an explosion of relief of all the things that couldn't be said, that can now be said openly, and there's a kind of, of joy and pleasure in it, the in, in terms of <clears throat> charisma itself, um, there's a um, an anthropologist at UCLA uh, who was a Chinese anthropologist who was sent in the Cultural Revolution to a village, and he's a very, a very uh, he must be five feet four and weigh 80 pounds soaking wet, so, right? Uh, but <clears throat> he, the villagers hated him because it was another mouth to feed, even if it was a small mouth. Um, and, um, uh, and he couldn't contribute any work worth anything. And so he was actually starving to death. Uh, and because he'd been sort of, uh, uh, had some schooling, he happened to know most of the Chinese uh, narrative myths. And so after dinner, he somehow stumbled into telling one of these myths, and people gathered around because he was a good storyteller. Um, and he had, as he said it, he had maybe 60 or 70 Chinese myths that he could write, uh, talk about. And the, the peasants only wanted to hear about five or six of them that were their favorites again and again and again and again, right? Uh, and they, as long as he would be telling these stories, they'd feed him crumbs. And so, in a sense, his, his literal, as he put it, his literal survival depended on the calories uh, that he could get by telling the stories that they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And so, in a sense, th they selected his repertoire, mm -hmm. if you like, in a, in a, in a vital way, right, uh, mm -hmm. that was uh, life-saving, he would say. Mm -hmm. Great. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody in the action like to get the uh, first question in? I, I think yeah. Who has the? Uh, who has the got one over there. Yeah. No. So I know. I'm just. But anyway, I mean, it, there's a. Yeah. Hi. The, the, the oh. simplicity of. Uh, I mean, we all have the experience. Uh, no, no one is immune, of, of being 
dressed down and silenced by someone and uh, then going away and rehearsing the speech that we wish we could have given, right? Maybe we give it to our friends and say that bastard, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it, it, it's held in in the, situ in the place where it belongs, but it's circulating, right? In the, in the slave quarters, it's circulating, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the prison system, it's circulating among the serfs and so on. Um, and so it's, a, it's, a, it's so ubiquitous that, and it's interesting to us when it becomes, if you like, a shared transcript, as I would put it, right? Mm -hmm. That has mm -hmm. uh, uh, a kind of yeah. power uh, over lots of people. Yeah, hidden so. yet shared, yeah. Hi. Um, I wondered if you have any observations about a resistance in everyday resistance in a globalized world. I mean, you spoke about how the nation state boundaries are, you know, uh, not something that the environment listens to um, or that, you know, uh, has relevance for climate debates. But, you know, in a world with migratory flows, do you have any kind of thoughts on what kind of resistance people in the middle of these kinds of movements, um, you know, where the state is alternatively murky um, and clear because, you know, if you can get papers to a country, maybe you are able to, I don't know, s settle down and, and, and survive. Anyways, my question is, in a world where national boundaries are murky, what kind of resistance is possible, decentralized, every day? I expect you've thought about this more than I have. Um, I'm not a political scientist. Uh, I'm that, right, I, I hold that in your favor. <laughs> uh, the, um, so, two things. I, I'm not an expert on, on migration, although it seems to me it's, it's impossible to understand national politics of many, 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 many nations now without taking into account the diaspora and the remittances uh, and so on. Uh, and in some cases, you know, um, uh, a lot of the resistance in Burma is, is funded by people in the Burmese diaspora and so on. So the nation state no longer contains, if you like, forms of even open uh, political dissent. And in fact, if you're beyond the state's borders, you are immune to some forms of direct repression, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the, the other thing is that, I think uh, this came up in a, uh, earlier this morning, in neoclassical economics, the three factors of uh, production uh, are uh, land, labor, and capital. And capital moves seamlessly without friction from one country to another at the push of a button now, right? And it seems to me that if, if you're a true neoclassical liberal, then understanding migration is to understand that this is the, a major factor of production, AKA labor, that is trying to seek its highest return, just the way capital seeks its highest return by moving from place to place to place, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so, and yet it's thwarted by national boundaries. Uh, and I'm, I am sure that the number of, I hesitate, hesitate to use the word tricks, but the, the number of strategies, I, I can imagine, let's say, that the people going across the Mediterranean to Lampedusa or to Greece and so on have a whole series of things that they've learned about how to stay safe and what to do and where to move and what to avoid and how to dress and, and where to get off the boat and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so it seems to me that, in a sense, there's a there's a world that's specific to different strategies and movement in a particular geographical area, but it's um, it's 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 a world. It's not as if this is new. That is to say, 
how can we understand European politics without the out migration to the New World and other places, right? Uh, from Germany and France and Poland and so on. Um, so it, it, that is to say, uh, the pressure on those countries from a, a landless proletariat would have been much more enormous uh, were there not this sort of safety valve in the new world. Um, so I'm not an expert on migration, but I, I think um, the narratives of migration and the, um, I, I did mention a, a group, it always struck me that it, it was a brilliant strategy, a group of Sri Lankans coming illegally to Halifax in uh, Canada decided collectively, uh, they had all these papers, and but they realized that their papers were probably not going to be helpful and maybe um, worse than not helpful. Uh, and so they all decided to throw all their papers in the ocean uh, the day before they landed. And they landed, you know, if you like, clean with no papers and with a narrative that they could make up from zero, right? Um, I don't, unfortunately, they didn't follow up to say what happened to them, <laughs> but it's the absence of papers and uh, identification that people move with what mm -hmm. struck me as an interesting strategy of uh, avoiding documentation altogether, mm -hmm. right? Rather than getting the right documentation. Mm -hmm. But you know, on this point of, I just want to follow up a little bit, this, like, what are the possibilities and how does decentralized resistance fit in? So, you know, the, the story you're telling, I think it's a more powerful story than you're even letting on because one part of the story is this is how you avoid you know, repression. This is how you avoid you know, being, being surveilled, being monitored, being found out if you resist in this kind of way. But it's also true that you know, resisting in a decentralized everyday way also avoids the repression of the control of other resistors. Okay? Correct. So, and the fact that normally if you're in a resistance movement that actually seeks to prevail, it's got to be very organized. And it's going to have to have extremely strong top-down control. And so it's also the case that you know, you're kind of out of the, out of the, you know, out of the pot into the fire if, if resistance takes a form that's not decentralized, that's not everyday, takes on organized form, and you're basically inviting the coercion of, so you, you, your, your resistance to official authority requires obedience to those who are resisting <laughs> authority. Correct. Right? It's, it's so, power all the way down. <laughs> yes, to put it more, much more you know, eloquently. Yes, right. exactly. Other, uh, so we got one in the back here. Um, Professor Scott, I just want to say that I studied your work and I've taught your work um, in multiple classes in multiple settings and I am so grateful, um, as I'm sure many of the people in the room are today, um, to be able to have a conversation with you about it. Um, I wanted to maybe um, raise the question of noticing, but the difference between noticing resistance and romanticizing resistance. Um, and maybe just give you three quick examples. Um, what first from your talk today, when you talked about the third of Confederate soldiers who deserted, um, they likely deserted, as you said, because they didn't want to die to maintain you know, wealthy, pe wealthy people's power, but they probably didn't desert because they respected the rights of African Americans or you know, were alive to the racism that was practiced against them. Um, the second example that I have is um, Chinese who in the late um, 19th century, um, despite the fact that they you know, were both, did not have citizenship and were closed off the possibility of having citizenship, um, were able to still fight in the American court system and, you know, and win um, several legal battles. These are battles that they won against um, racist whites who feared the challenge um, of their, of labor, of that they, prov that they um, feared the challenge that they caused towards unions, which might be able to, you know, up the price of labor. Um, but their, their struggle, their successful struggle in the courts was underwritten by um, American corporations who, of course, wanted to be able to continue to have access to the cheaper labor that the Chinese provided. Um, and then the third one is, again, from your 
um, talk today where you mentioned um, the you know, number of Catholics, um, Catholic peasants who would not marry. Um, and of course, it's possible to read that as resistance to the patriarchy, but it's also possible to read that as a valorization of marriage, that because marriage was considered so important, people or is considered so important, people don't get married until they can have the show, until they can afford the wedding dress and the church wedding and right. you know the hundreds of guests, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm wondering if you can just you know, take some of these examples or some of your own and help us to think about the difference between seeing resistance to power but also recognizing that just because it's resistance, it doesn't necessarily mean a rejection of, of power. Right. I, that is to say, here, here, as, as I understand it, thank you for your question. It's um, uh, subtle and elaborate. Um, the, and it's certainly true that the deserting Confederate forces were not abolitionists, right? Uh, and, and I guess my question would be, why do you require them? Why, why do you require um, pure motives, right, uh, from uh, resistors? And it's a little like what E.P. Thompson says, you know, that uh, the, the idea that kind of material objects like food and, uh, uh, and firewood and so on uh, are um, at the center of a kind of struggle. Uh, and this is, uh, if you like, not to be dismissed in the favor of pure idealistic right uh, motives that would make if you like the resistance um, unassailable morally I guess um, the um, I don't, it, you had the Chinese example and the last example was the, the example of um, Catholic peasants who don't marry. And oh, I see, right. Um, it, to take the last one, um, as I understand Catholicism in Latin America, um, it involved, um, if you like, um, these uh, the funding of fiestas, religious fiestas, saints' days, festivals. Um, and uh, this happens in the Philippines historically, I guess, as well, right? Uh, you have, uh, if you like, um, on a saints' day, a couple of prominent people will fund, you know, the, the feast and all of the celebrations, and they'll be then raised in status uh, in recognition of how they help celebrate the Saints' Day, right? And it, 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 and it means, so at a, at a lower level, it means that a culturally acceptable marriage within the institutions requires resources. That is, and that's true for burials, it's true for marriages uh, and so on. And so in a sense, every culture has, if you like, a ceremonial level of citizenship in which certain rituals have to be performed in certain ways. And if you don't have the money to do that, uh, you are thereby uh, lowered in esteem and so on. So for example, in my Malay village in, in Kedah in, in Malaysia, um, the during uh, Eid coming up, uh, uh, the poorest people uh, could never invite people to their house for treats, which is the sort of standard of mm -hmm. citizenship. And they were so humiliated that they wouldn't go to other people's uh, house for treats uh, uh, as, as well. And so in a sense, it seems to me that, that a kind of culture in which resources measure your ability to live up to the cultural esteem uh, 
of a whole series of ceremonies uh, results in the um, abasement of a per certain portion of the population. Uh, and so, in a sense, uh, yes, they get married as common law marriages because they can't afford the, uh, the rituals which they probably would celebrate. It's not a form of descent from that. They can't afford it. But it becomes, in a sense, a practice uh, that is, at a practical level, resistance to the sacrament of marriage, right? Uh, and I think the, um, uh, the Catholic Church was able to tolerate large amounts of that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that I've done justice to the question of, of corporations and labor and so on, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Chinese proletariat, but I'll let that go. Mm -hmm. We have a question up here. Thank you. Um, as First off, as, as an anthropologist and a graduate student, I wanted to thank you for your kind remarks on both fronts. Um, <laughs> my question is, it, it seems as though resistance is so often in the eyes of the beholder, with the beholder more or less as the state. Um, so then as social scientists, how do we study resistance without putting on the lenses of the oppressor? Can you look at resistance from a position other than that of the state, if it only exists in the gaze of the state. And then at the same time, given your excellent examples today, how is this something we can look at in real time? Or can we only examine these sorts of everyday forms of resistance uh, with the, the benefit of historical hindsight? Like, do we need historical distance to determine what is everyday resistance and what is someone being late to work, for example? I didn't get the last, if you could repeat the last question. Yeah. The, my, the second question is, can we, can we see this sort of everyday resistance in real time? Or do we need historical distance to evaluate if something is, is truly a, a form of everyday resistance? So it, if we're interested, if you like, in the tacit cooperation below the visible spectrum, right, the radar, if you like, uh, uh, then I don't see any reason why, that's why I honor anthropology, right? Uh, I don't think any political scientist should be allowed out the door without being strapped to an anthropologist in the morning. Uh, and, and it seems to me, but it, what it requires is, in a sense, a kind of saturation and understanding the discourse that underpins certain acts and that justify them and 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 for ordinary people historicize them so in a sense the at one level all i'm asking for is that we credit people at the bottom of the heap with uh values aesthetics history right uh and so on and and capacity for cognitive understanding of what they're doing uh and it's just that it is um, it's open declaration would be dangerous, right? that's all. Um, so the question of, I mean, I, it, it's also true, I suppose, that distance helps us understand some things that are not clear uh, at, uh, at closer historical range. I can't think of a a uh, good example, but I'm but I, I accept the premise of your uh, of your question. Putting on the lens of the state, it seems to me that in a sense, um, it, it, there, there's I, I have a way of saying that the job of the peasants is to stay out of the archives. That is to say, once they appear in the archives, right, you know there's been trouble, right? Uh, and so, in a sense, it's the forms of resistance that I'm talking about are meant to escape except in their aggregate effects. I mean, that is to say, uh, I believe that, let's say, the kind of work done in the Soviet bloc by people who hated their job uh, and spent all their time at their weekend garden, uh, the, the desertions, right, land invasions, 
all of these um, these can have and and or can have enormous effects historically uh, and sort of tax avoidance by poor people who are dead taxes and so on. Um, they can add up in an aggregate way that can threaten states and threaten right um, uh, whole regimes. But it's so it, it seems to me that the job is to escape the individuals who are doing this activity are trying to evade the lens of the state. If the state sees it and defines it as resistance, it becomes another uh, object for our examination, right? Um, and uh, often the cumulative effects over time of thousands and thousands of acts that are only loosely coordinated, right, can have aggregate effects in destroying regimes and their viability, right? Uh, I mean, the desertion is the easiest example of that when you start losing your, right, uh, your troops. And so it's, um, I don't know if I've answered your question correctly but, or, or adequately, but uh, feel free to repose it. Okay. If I can get a, the two finger on that, um, what I find interesting about your question um, is it makes one kind of think about the, the kind of, first the audience of the resistance and then also kind of the barometer of success. I mean, part of what, what Jim hinted at before was that resistance buoys other humans. It's like, that's not the gaze of the state, that's other people are benefiting and empowered from the resistance act itself. Because, um, I mean, the beef that many kind of social scientists had with Jim basically was kind of like, it's like, well, yeah, but how does it matter? And then Jim hint hinted at the kind of like, uh, what's the, the mollusks, and they kind of come together. I mean, like, so, you know, he was trying, he was trying to address it, but th this, uh, this kind of like, you know, how does it matter? How is it efficacious? What impact does it have? The buoying of humanity bit is like completely undervalued. It's like, okay, it's like we might increase the wage over here, we might get some land, we might get redistribution on this, but if our general existence on the planet is facilitated and improved in some way, shape, or form, it's just like, what, you know, what's that thriving measure that talks about your, your joy at getting up every day? I'm like, you know, it's just like there's, there's a metric for that, right? And like, and, and buoying of humanity is kind of in that. And so I found that to be kind of an interesting, as I was thinking, I was like, oh, how would I answer that? But, um, but I think the, it's like, once you start seeing the kind of like Black Lives Matter posters going up, I'm just like, okay, th this is a buoying of humanity. Everybody shows up to the house that's for it, it's okay, otherwise they're, they're hindered by it. So it's like, there's a, I think there's so many manifestations of it, or putting stickers on your kind of like, uh, on your phone or, or your computer. I mean, it's just like, there is this constant communication that we're having with one another about different things, and you're either buoyed by it or you're not. And so I found that to be kind of, implied in many respect within much of Jim, Jim's work, but I think it changes our metrics of how we're thinking about how will we go about evaluating success and resonance and so forth. Yeah, I think actually a kind of a concrete example of both things you're talking about in the question of both something happening as we speak uh, and also something that depends a lot on how the state sees it is, and I'm sure this is something you've been, you've been thinking about, is these, these massive population movements outside of Russia right now since the war has begun. And so how one thinks about this, because there's this, there's this narrative of like, this is cowardice, like stay, oppose the regime, oppose the war, right? And from another perspective, maybe one more, you know, conducive to the, to the analysis here, this is how, th th this, this can be a form of resistance. But then it also raises the question, is it desertion if you're not, a, is, this, is this something only for troops? Is this something that, that when, when, the right. citizens, when the citizenry flees. So how, as you've been watching this unfold, I'm sure you've had thoughts about this. No, it's, it, it, yeah. it leads to a, a big question which I didn't talk about, which is, um, to quote Albert Hirschman, uh, exit, mm -hmm. right? That is to say, uh, to what degree do we consider exit, mm -hmm. um, of course desertion is a kind of exit, um, uh, to what degree do we consider certain forms of collective exit to be a form of resistance? So, for example, truancy from school. You know, Pivot and Cloward in their book treat truancy as uh, a form of mm -hmm. dissent, contempt, uh, etc., resistance to the uh, 
school discipline and hierarchy uh, and so on, and people just stay away. Um, exit in terms of, you know, emigration is, is one example, but internal emigration, that is, how does one understand the Amish and Hutterites, right, uh, and Mennonites uh, who try to live a world separate from, uh, as much as possible, from the jurisdictions within which they leave? How do we understand the hippie movement, right, of the 60s, of going off the grid and so on? It wasn't participation, it was withdrawal and exit, but it expressed a level of contempt, if you like, for bourgeois, respectable styles of life and so on, uh, and celebration of the body and uh, freedom and so on. And so uh, that is to say, it, that kind of cultural descent in language, in forms of residence, in forms of local social organization, and so on. Um, to what degree are they intended to be forms of resistance? And perhaps more important, how is it treated by the state? That is to say, you know, the, the old believers in Russia were repressed, right? Uh, whereas, you know, the hippies more or less got to do more or less what they wanted to do, all right? Uh, and so it, a lot depends on whether it manifests itself as resistance depends in a sense on the degree of latitude uh, that is uh, available before something is seen as a threat and repressed. So we have several questions in the back. Could we collect a few at a time to make it go faster, or what let's do you maybe, prefer? Let's go one by one for one now, one. I okay. think. I think it's still, still, still better. Hi, I'm in the Falsy Department, former student Christian. Um, should I speak up a little? Speak loudly, please. I'm having trouble understanding you. So my question is about how your work is sort of engaging with the philosophy discussion around justified civil and uncivil disobedience. I really like that you suggest an act can be political and resistance, even if it's not intended to be, because of facts about group intentions or how the act is interpolated by the state. Uh, I think it's interesting that this sort of cuts against what Rawls, Martin Luther King Jr., and, and Candace Delmas say about uh, civil and uncivil disobedience. They suggest it has to be conscientious, principled. Martin Luther King Jr. says you actually have to go through a set sequence of moral purification. And you're sort of suggesting, like, you might be able to actually just bumble into justified disobedience, sort of the way Huck Finn does. And I, I just sort of wanted to ask, like, is that sort of the position that you're defending? Do you think it's useful to think of this in terms of, like, justified or unjustified uncivil disobedience? I want to ask you what uncivil resistance is. So the distinction, this is something Candace Delmas says in response to, like, Rawls and Martin Luther King Jr., that if it's done not in the public, if it's done perhaps violently or there's destruction of property, or maybe even we use bad words that are uncivil. These are all ways in which disobedience might be uncivil. Uh, but Candace Delmas thinks it could still be justified, um, but in the case that it's still principled and there's respect for human life and others' interest in non-domination, there's some side constraints. Yeah, I, 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 I just... I, I don't think it's extremely rare in my, it, it seems to me to be extremely rare to ever have civil resistance without uncivil resistance as an accompaniment, right? Um, and that has to do often with the the response of the police and, and officials uh, and so on. That something that starts out as civil disobedience is meant to be, you know, if you like, uh, uh, peaceful and nonviolent um, um, sparks, right? Uh, and, and what's also interesting, I'm, I'm thinking of the, 
it's a debate I had actually in a over over dinner with someone who was it, this was the World Trade Organization, the so-called battle in Seattle, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and it was a very peaceful march, except the black bloc from Eugene, uh, Oregon, came up and started smashing uh, store windows. No one was hurt, but you know mm -hmm. it was property damage, and it was uncivil, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, disobedience. What was interesting to me is that the peaceful marches were virtually not covered at all in the media, and it was the black bloc who broke windows, right, for a day and a half, that called attention to the vast sort of civil uh, disobedience, if you like, that was going on in Seattle. So. It, it was interesting to me that the attention to the civil disobedience was parasitic on the uncivil disobedience mm. that made was newsworthy mm. because it was not peaceful because it was uncivil. Right? I mean, it's interesting mm. that uncivilized. Right? Um, it's un worth unpacking those words. Yeah. We just got a question online that I actually have to ask you because this this question in just a very short form captures more of your research, puts more of your research together than any I've ever heard. This, I love this. This is from Adam Ashforth, whose work I imagine you, you know and admire. So those of you who don't know, some of Jim's earliest work was on corruption, patient clientelism, before he moved on to these questions of resistance. So, so Adam asks, can we understand actions that are conventionally called corruption as forms of resistance? Yes. <laughs> A short question, short answer. Okay. So, yeah. so, so, in a sense, um, a, a, a certain kinds of corruption. Mm. So, um, you know, in most societies, ninety percent of the, or more than ninety percent of the population, have no role whatsoever in making legislation and making the rules and making the structure of uh, uh, of taxation, um, regulation, and so on. Mm -hmm. It's made without their mm -hmm. consent, without their knowledge, and so on. And so the only thing that many peasants in the village in which I lived, that uh, the only way they had influence over legislation was to evade it by paying a small bribe. So, I mean, that is to say the police knowing the rules, if your motorcycle had a non-functioning uh, light, you had to pay a bribe or, right, or you were fined uh, or they would confiscate your motorcycle. And so it became a kind of, if you like, um, uh, money-making operation for uh, the police. Uh, and a lot of the petty corruption was just to escape all of this, right? Uh, people had to uh, provide the, the so-called Islamic zakat, which is the tax uh, uh, for uh, within Islam, uh, mostly meant to support uh, poor people uh, and landless people, um, was um, when I was there, it had been distributed entirely within the village and was a local thing and was quite popular and um, effective. Uh, but shortly before I came, uh, the zakat, all the rice that was paid uh, by zakat was now sent to the provincial capital and not a penny ever came back to the village. Uh, and so people would fill their, uh, uh, they put dirt and rocks in their uh, sacks of rice. Uh, and to, if you had a bad meal, a really bad meal, and the rice was bad, you said, that is zakat rice uh, <laughs> that I just ate. Uh, and so it seems to me that, that, that a lot of petty corruption, and I'm talking about petty corruption, mm -hmm. is in fact influence at the enforcement stage, which is the only stage at which mm -hmm. this influence is even open uh, to ordinary people. So yeah. that form of corruption is, if you like, um, well, it's a, it, I don't know, there's a great, a great, great book actually um, on Africa called um, Roadblock Politics mm. um, by 
a Danish scholar, I think, or um, uh, not a Danish, a Dutch scholar. Um, and it's about the seizure of, uh, of uh, intersections of roads, uh, or pa it could be passes in an earlier pa period, or streets of Malacca and so on. Mm -hmm. You control, uh, if you like, um, a bottleneck in transportation routes. Uh, you declare sovereignty, you collect bribes, uh, and so on. Um, and so there, that sort of, uh, and it's like a stateness at a micro level uh, is, uh, it's a kind of, I thought it's a, it's a brilliant insight and mm -hmm. unpacks how it works in large parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. I knew that was gonna list an awesome answer. I was not disappointed, that was great, that was great. Back to the crowd. So I was uh, struck listening to your talk. At times you use the language of resistance and at times you use the language of dissent and you seem to move, oscillate rather seamlessly between them. So I'm wondering, do you think it's either descriptively or analytically useful to distinguish between resistance and dissent? And if so, when is it useful? Why is it useful? How is it useful? So we'll give him back the microphone, please. <laughs> So would you, would you consider, let's say, the dressing of the mods and rockers in England at a certain period or the hippies, uh, I would call that, I guess, cultural dissent that might end up in some circumstances like the zoot suit being defined as resistance and repressed, right? Um, but it's, it is in a sense, and so I'm thinking more of, I don't know, off the top of my head, something like cultural exit, right? Um, and I think of that as dissent uh, rather than, that is, it doesn't aim at changing power, it aims at escaping it kind of collectively, right? Uh, and so that, I think, is what, now that you you trigger me to think ca more carefully about it. I think that's the distinction I want to make between resistance and uh, dissent, and often they're combined, right? Mm -hmm. That is to say, cultural resistance, c uh, cultural dissent can also be um, uh, uh, bundled with uh, resistance. So, for example, um, the I, I was I, I went to a tiny little Quaker school in New Jersey, and uh, there were conscientious, obje conscientious objectors, um, and you could say they just didn't want to. They were pacifists. They didn't want to fight. They were all put in prison, right? Um, uh, and um, uh, they refused to stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance and so on. Um, and it, it got treated as a form of resistance, uh, but it was intended by them initially, I think, as a form of escape. They would have been perfectly happy just to, right? Have it be escape. Um, may, may I um, yeah, hi. Thank you for that for the really uh, remarkable talk. I just wanted to ask if um, does your model address and or complicate collaboration as one of the transcripts of decentralized resistance, especially in imperial colonial contexts? As sorry, I can't understand you. Um, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm, ask, I'm saying does your model address or complicate collaboration as a, as a transcript, um, especially in the case of imperial colonial um, South and Southeast Asia? And it stems from reading a subaltern understanding of your work and quoting you extensively. And it almost seems like some of the everyday forms of resistance um, spill over into actions which, which has been interpreted as collaboration by some scholarly literature, such as monarch monarchical hegemony as petitions that you mention, or even colonial participation. And I wonder, with a lot of nervousness, if resistance as a negation has, has somewhat of an equal value to complicated acts of collaboration as a generative project. I'm 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 going to try to respond to the parts of your question 
that uh, I absorbed effectively. Um, so, I mean, you point me to other forms of my work, right, that uh, are not formally on the table today. Uh, and the, in the art of not being governed, it's essentially an account of people who evaded the state relatively effectively in the hills of Southeast Asia uh, over time. And my argument is that they, um, we tend to think of forms of subsistence and social structure as being kind of given. Um, and my argument is that certain forms of subsistence are more state evasive than others so that hunters and gatherers and Swideners and so on. Um, you know, for a tax collector, Swidening is almost impossible because there are 50 or 60 crops growing. They ripen at different times. Um, uh, and uh, the, the fields move, and often the people move. Uh, and so for a state, uh, the job of the state is to get people to settle down and plant a taxable crop, right? Uh, and and, it, and my argument is that we ought to understand, at least in part, the choice of subsistence as a choice of um, how liable your form of subsistence is to capture uh, and taxation uh, from the state. So that, for example, uh, growing roots and tubers, it, that is to say, uh, all states, classical states, uh, tended to be grain states, cereal grain states, um, growing a taxable crop above the ground that can be assessed. And uh, you can actually go to the granary and take it all and finish people off. Or if you hate them, you can just burn their fields when it's ripe and so on. Whereas if you're planting potatoes and cassava, um, the state has to dig them up one by one, uh, just the way you do. Uh, and you're kind of untaxable and can stay in the ground for two or three years. Uh, and so it seems to me that, that, that both the geography of state evasion, I deal in that book essentially was with um, mountains, but swamps uh, and marshes uh, and wetlands are also extremely important as places where people flee to um, in order to escape uh, the state, so that the Great Dismal Swamp uh, at the beginning of the Civil War had 6,000 escaped slaves living there, many of whom had never met a white person, uh, were the second or third generation. They hadn't made it to Canada or to the North. Um, uh, and so this was a zone of refuge, a zone in which subsistence was quite possible, actually, uh, because it was a relatively rich area in terms of wetland abundance. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I mean, the Marsh Arabs are another example, uh, who were, in a sense, finished off by Saddam Hussein, who drained the, uh, those marshes. Uh, it happens, my son, who's a doctor, is in this right now in the Sud, which is that part of the, uh, the Nile um, that is essentially a swamp in marshland. Mm -hmm. And it's a place to which South Sudanese flee in order to get away from the state historically. And so all of these places have been, right, if you like, refuges of one kind or another. I may have missed part of your, uh, part of your question. If so, right. I apologize. Okay. Cool. Christian, Yeah, my thinking was um, your, your question kind of like reifies the big outcome, right? So um, if slaves are brought into the house, they're then rendered complicit with slavery, but if they're using that as an opportunity to poison the master, <laughs> I'm like, okay, so what is it? Uh, and so, okay, the master doesn't die because you have it. It's okay, they failed in their effort to kind of subvert, but that's what they're using. So it seems like um, if folks are looking for not cost free, but 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 limited cost options for engaging in behavior that reduce the likelihood of them like dying for doing it. Um, it seems like these things that we would call collaboration are, are opportunities for resistance that are more or less effective, right? So I, I guess I would not kind of like allow for the dichotomization. So, so you, Eugene Genovese has an interesting section in Roll Jordan Roll in which, in a sense, the difference between house slaves and field slaves, 
is that house slaves required more acting, if you like, right? They're in the presence of the master all the time, and their mood and so on and pleasing them are uh, your, if you like, power life world about which you have to navigate, whereas field slaves, uh, their contact with uh, white masters is brutal, but, uh, but less, uh, if you like, daily intensive. And, and his argument, which I found completely interesting, is that at the end of the Civil War, when the, sa when the slaves fled, his argument is that everybody understood that the slaves, the field slaves would go. But the acting of the house slaves was such that they thought these people were completely loyal and would stay with them. And almost all of them left as well. And for them, it was, if you like, a veil. It, it was, if you like, the end of a successful performance, right? Uh, and they couldn't believe that these people uh, left because they thought these people loved them because they acted as if they, they loved them. So there's a passage in, I'm a big fan of oral histories and Roll Jordan Roll, The Life of Nate Shaw is a, one of my all time favorites. And there's a, uh, this is, if you like, performance. Um, Nate Shaw, whose actual name was Ned Cobb, um, had to get a loan, wanted to get a loan, and he had dealings with a hardware store, a white hardware store owner, uh, and he thought he could get a loan from the hard, hardware store owner. And he thought for quite a long time about how he was going to approach the hardware store owner. He sort of stayed in the hardware store for 45 minutes chatting him up and so on and gradually he got his, um, uh, by acts of deference and uh, sort of abject kinds of things, um, he got his loan. And he comes back and there's a part of me who thinks he should feel degraded by having to put on a performance of abjection. On the other hand, I'm completely wrong because it comes back with a sense of triumph. I, it was a brilliant performance. I tricked him into giving uh, me the loan. Uh, you know, I did exactly what he expected me to do. It was a completely brilliant performance of, <laughs> uh, of abjectness. And he felt elevated and triumphant rather than uh, somehow degraded by having to act like a slave. And it was interesting to me that, that, mm -hmm. that in a sense, the performative aspect of this is really complicated in terms <laughs> of how people understand it. That's all. Mike? Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, I want to ask you a question about the emotions, affect, um, sentiment. Um, both you and Christian made reference to joy and pleasure. Uh, as people are doing, um, you know, Libby Wood, your colleague, talks about pleasure and agency, right? So certain kinds of resistance allow people to become authors of their own histories, their own stories. Um, and that kind of is in harmony with a lot of elements of your, um, of your work which privilege, you know, the, um, the intentional and uh, the exercise of agency. So I want to ask you about negative emotions, um, what some people have called ugly feelings, for instance, things like envy, resentment, irritation, which an author like Sian Gai talks about as being linked to blocked agency, obstructed. Linked to what? Blocked agency. Blocked agency. Um, obstructed agency. So um, mm -hmm. I, I wonder if you see that as having any kind of role in the model of decentralized resistance you're talking about? Uh, thanks for that, Mike. We've talked together several times. Um, 
the uh, I'm thinking. Um, it seems to me that a, a, a lot of of what comes out when you have these outbursts of anger that may actually result in uprisings or insurrections and so on of one kind or another, that they, they are, in a sense, the explosion of resentment and envy and so on that has been muzzled and that cannot be expressed except in very safe, uh, safe contexts. And so I'm thinking of, let's say, the, the um, it's a story that, that somehow is, it's Frederick Douglass's bio, uh, autobiography of, of when he actually got in a physical fight with his master, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And it looks like a, a kind of triumphant moment in which he actually beat the master and the master decided not to mess with him anymore and that it was, in a sense, a successful individual revolt. But it was both the actual fight was an expression of agency. Uh, however, the fuel behind the fight, mm -hmm. uh, was it not sort of a hatred, anger, and so on that was blocked agency? Um, and, and, and in a sense, the release of that energy in a protest that somehow explodes that has been right repressed. It seems to me that those two are 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 um, one acts as fuel for the other. Mm -hmm. That's all. I'm not. I'm not a. I yeah. wish I were a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but you know, <laughs> I'm just making this up as it goes along. <laughs> And like, uh, and like, it's interesting. As you were saying this, I, I thought not of microaggressions, but micro resistance. And then there's something to be said, I think, for being able to survive with an oppressive and repressive context and things going on by having these kind of micro resistances. I remember um, um, he's now left Kiyotsuzui, but we were at some meeting um, among sociologists. So we'll, we'll pick on them for a minute. Um, and um, you know, someone made some remark, right? Which was just kind of like, so sort of like, um, um, they asked, uh, I asked a question, they answered it, and then afterwards they came up and offered me, offered me their card, and like, you know, wanted me to apply to their program when I finished. And so I'm just like, um, I'm like, yeah, okay. And so then, like, you know, I was then proceeded to kind of talk to the speaker and kind of ignore this person. Um, and then Keo was just like, yo, man, what what what's up with that? I'm like, it happens all the time. And so Keo was offended by it, and I was just kind of like. Um, Moving past with and, and the kind of like and my micro resistance was I asked you know what I viewed as a, a reasonable question and just kind of proceeded. We were at another event. The same exact thing happens and Keo freaking loses it, and he's just like yo this doesn't bother you. I'm just like and I thought of Claude Steele's work and stereotype threat and so forth. I'm just like my interactions and how I was kind of like going about um, engaging with different folks in the room was just like. It was, it was just seething with micro resistance, which no, not many people were catching up. A couple of people every now and then be like, yo, man, that was, that, that was dope how you did that. But they didn't see how I was responding to this other thing. But so I'm wondering if you're able to kind of like tolerate um, these ugly emotions by chipping away and maintaining some dignity by these kind of like micro resistances, which allow you to kind of thrive. This is uh, mm. using the kind of like stereotype literature or how to, how to, how to thrive and survive it. Because I, I, I'm reading like uh, Whistling Vivaldi, and I'm just like, damn, I'm like, I'm like, this is fascinating. But Claude Steele's answer was just like, um, the discrimination, the racism is no longer salient to you, and thus those remarks and all those things just like completely don't have any impact. But then it occurred to me, there's um, this book called The Farrakhan Factor. There was this organization called the Nation of Islam back <laughs> in the day, and people used to talk about it. But the, Far the Farrakhan Factor, there's a chapter in there which is basically by like Leon Pitts or something like that, and he's just like, the power of Farrakhan and his impact on black Americans and how he resonated with them was all caught up within Farrakhan's ability to ca kind of capture the FU. And it's just like, and that like, that the resonance of that and hearing someone say it and talk about things in a way that just kind of allowed you to have this micro resistance, which kind of you could then carry that FU with you to everywhere. Mm 
which then insulated you from all these other things. So it's interesting that you kind of go there with the, with the ugly emotions and, and blocked agency. And for me, I really think about folks that get out of jail for like, you know, wrongfully imprisoned. I'm like, where's the, where's the rage? It's like there's a narrative to that. There's a narrative performance to how they're supposed to behave and, and what they're not supposed to do. And I'm just like, I'm like, I think back to like the Farrakhan of the 80s. They would have they would have raised up some rage and or, or you know or go go to Malcolm somebody would have raised some rage but it's just like it's part of the performance now they can't express rage everything's fine we I'm just happy to be out unless there's a narrative to how this is done and you're just kind of going or you or you make it litigiously but I wonder about these blocked emotions for mm -hmm. folks like that because it doesn't seem like healthy or they're just beat down so much that that's no longer there and so. Um, I don't know this literature, but I'm I just so, I mean, look up on it. Uh, the, here's where the micro observation becomes important, mm -hmm. I think. That is to say, um, and it, this border between open dissent and disguised dissent or resistance mm -hmm. and so on, this border is always being the envelope is being tested, if you like, on both sides, for that matter, right, uh, over time. And so it seems to me that um, the good soldier Schweik is actually filled with this, in which Schweik says, yes, sir. And the officer doesn't know whether it's dripping with contempt he said the right words, mm -hmm. yes, sir, and he does what he's told to, but the voice doesn't sound like he's doing it in a happy way, <laughs> but it, it's not actionable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so what, what Schweig does is surfs along this sort of border, uh, just always staying uh, on the safe side, uh, and so on, and avoiding, right, the retaliation that would come if it was open. And and the point is, there's a lot of pleasure in the agency of doing that and seeing how much you can get away with, right? I mean, it's a little like, and if it's tolerated, it's likely to um, uh, be amplified. Let us say, just the way that if the speed limit is 60 and people go 65 and nobody knows that everybody understands you'll never be arrested by a policeman for going 65, then some people are going to try 70, right? Um, and if that goes right, then the sort of general speed limit. So there's this, if you like, this additive effect of the the of how the envelope changes over time, and then of course you know if you if you want to just hang 20 people who've gone 80 miles an hour, you can stop it all right away, right? But the point is that it's, a, it's that, um, the, if you like, it, it has a kind of imitative instruction value that, in a sense, shows people where the border is and whether it's moving in any way, right? And I, I, haven't, I haven't talked at all, you know, the, from the other side of the of the of the power spectrum, um, my ex colleague Michael Lipsky, mm -hmm. who wrote a book called Street Level Bureaucracy, mm -hmm. has a tremendous amount to say about foot dragging and resistance and so on of people at the top who, you know, let's say you have a a welfare a welfare system and you don't want to expend much of its budget. You make the um, you make the forms uh, almost impossible to fill out. You make the office hours inconvenient, right? You make the number of steps that you have to go through to get housing or this or that or that benefit and so on. And so, you know, I think the recent book is it by Mac Desmond um, about poverty um, is also about the way in which people don't know how to navigate a system to access the welfare benefits, benefits to which they are entitled. And that is not a mistake. It is a kind of bureaucratic strategy to make sure only a certain percentage of people ever get to the candy store. Uh, so if you like, uh, 
from the bureaucratic, from the level of power, there's also a manipulation of a facade of entitlements mm -hmm. that are in fact uh, littered with obstacles and blockages and so on, just to make sure that um, uh, uh, they're not accessed uh, massively. This all is making me think of, so I was recently at a, at a piano performance, this concerto with my daughter, who's a musician. And uh, two hours, this musician, she's got no sheet music, plays just piece after piece, totally from memory. I'm just totally blown away. And I asked my daughter, I said, well, how, does she, how could she possibly remember all that music? And her answer was, she doesn't remember the music. The music lives in her. And I think when you listen to Jim, and I think when you listen to Christian as well, this is what it looks like when someone has spent their career and that just building up knowledge, observations, intuitions, observations about the world. And those things live in Jim. And they, they live in Christian too. And we're, we're seeing that. I think it's an amazing thing to witness. It's a real gift. Um, that Jim's able to come and share all this with us. It's a gift also that Christian was uh, willing to, you know, take the lead in making this happen and to share his insights as well. It's really, really, I think, a gift to all of us. And uh, I just want to invite everyone to, to join me in thanking them for the gift they've given us today. Thank you. Thank you.